Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for another blessed opportunity to gather together and open up your word and study together, another opportunity to fellowship together. We just praise you and thank you for your grace in our lives. We pray, Father, that you forgive us if we have sinned against thee. Continue to search our hearts and show us, Father, any defiling thing that is in us and help us, Lord, as we continue in this dispensation and as we will each learn um, more and more truth that might touch each one of us in a in a different way. Help us, Father, to be fully surrendered to thee and ready, ready to follow and continue to follow all the way till the end. We pray, Father, for those that are back in Washington as this, this impeachment continues to play out. Lord, we pray for strength and courage and boldness for those that are standing for your truth, Father, and that you would continue to, to give them the courage and the boldness they need, the steadfastness to stand for the liberties of the people of this nation and to stand for what is right and what is justice and what is true in these matters. We ask a special blessing, Father, upon our sister Christine and sister Adriana as they're going to present the study tonight. May you give them clarity of thought and clarity of mind in all that they have to share with us tonight. May your Holy Spirit, I pray, be with us and help each one of us to understand these events, Father, and what they mean prophetically and what they and that they would do the work upon our hearts and helping us to get ready, that we would be fully prepared, Lord, to both the Levites and then to the Nethanims. We praise you and we thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is Tessa's presentation, and it's page 22. It's, um, it's um, Donald Trump, a man for his time, and we left off right here. Um, so I'm going to just start off. Um, this is Adriana's presentation, but you guys know she's uh, driving back right now. And so I'm just going to read through it and until she gets here. OK, so it's all those events of 2014 that paved the way for 2016. It's, it lists them. You have Black Lives Matter, racial issues. You have America entering Syria. You have Russia entering Ukraine. You have ISIS and what they did in 2014 to their captive American citizens. So all these issues in 2014, but it has done to the American public is make them question their American exceptionalism that they were promised in 1989. They find the candidate who promises to bring it back. We understand this from the internal that 2014 is the waymark of Sunday law and that there is a message unsealed that continues to swell. It's going to swell to the loud cry or for our history, we would call it the midnight cry. All this comes down to the period of test. That is how we internally view this history. The unsealing of a message the growth of the, that message to where there is an increase of knowledge and a formalization. And what we do, the methodology we use is to parallel, to parallel two different things. In this history, we can parallel the internal message, the internal movement with the external. Internally, we have had a movement from the very beginning. That movement does not start at its as an organized structure, it takes time to grow and develop. But from 2014, you can mark organization entering into this movement progressively. Let me know if it's uh, too small for anybody and I'll make it bigger. Let's see, there's a chat, but I will get to my chat. <laughs> It's not coming out. So if, if there's a question in chat, um, go ahead. Somebody um, could read it out loud. If there's a um, holler at me, because I, I can't seem to pull up the, the chat menu. So if somebody will uh, watch over those for me, that'd be great. Thanks. 
The message is not all understood in 2014. Instead, it has to grow and swell to where it is formalized at this waymark. If that is how the internal message behaves, what about the external message? If that's how the internal movement operates, it is sealed here, but it but takes time to develop and become visible. What about the internal? Internally, we can see 2014. We can see what happens in this year that leads to the message of 2018. Externally, we can see what developed here that led to 2016 and 2018. But I would suggest that this waymark, the waymark we associate with Sunday Law, we don't actually visibly see that much. Why does Ellen G. White say that the loud cry begins here and then swells? If it begins here, it begins with a whisper. It's not that loud. It's not that visible. It must need to grow just like our message does. So with the external and all those catalysts in 2014 are going to grow and swell. That movement, the uniting of the Republican Party, the evangelical right, all begins in 2014. It begins to grow and swell. You begin to identify external leaders, Donald Trump. Then you have him elected, but restrained. Then he starts taking over the branches of the government. He begins taking over the other offices, the role of the Attorney General, the Supreme Court. It begins in 2014, but it has a work of ex escalation. So just as it's identified in that article, what led to Donald Trump began in 2014. You can see it different ways. You can talk about 2009, 1989, but when we consider our dispensation, it's particularly the events of 2014 that come together that developed into Donald Trump's candidacy and election. Any questions? We became organized in that history. They become pain. Okay. Sorry, I got it. We became organized in that history. They became organized in that history, and I would suggest that behind all of this, whether it looks political or not, is a religious zeal. The problem people are having is that they cannot identify in the current politics in America that it is a result of the religious zeal of the evangelical right. What Donald Trump is enacting is the morality of the majority. As he has taken over the Supreme Court, he has done that more and more. He started to take away rights for women from those who identify as LGBTQ, rights right away from other and rights away from other races. Civil rights are under threat. Black lives are under threat. Immigration, all of those issues that we actually find back in 2014. And if we want to go back, we can find it in 1989. I want to finish in Great Controversy, Chapter 38. Great Controversy, Chapter 38 is titled The Final Warning. So where are we in history? If it's the final warning given to the world, it must be the last warning they have before they, their door is shut, before probation closes. So we would identify the final warning as the loud cry. If you were to see the chapters before, they are all dealing with Sunday law history. In the great controversy, she steps through the Sunday law history, then the final warning, and then the shut door. So this chapter 38, the final warning, is dealing with history, the Sunday law history. We will go to 610, paragraph 3. So um, in Great Controversy 610, paragraph 3, she's talking about the history of the loud cry. 
but so long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Were it not for those laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it is now. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God. But statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments. Thus, a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the Lord Wait, I'm sorry, that the third angel's message may do its work. When the final warning shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working, and some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. But as long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls, to some extent, the laws of the land. Were it not for those, these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it is now. So, what is she saying about this history? We understand that the loud cry history, what is happening to the Constitution, the laws of the land, they are being broken down, but she says there is still a restraining influence felt by the rulers and that it still controls to some extent the laws of the land. So there are still laws restraining the power that be from enacting their dictatorship. Um, many, while many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God. But statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments. Thus, a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. What's happening in this history? You have Satan's angel, agents and God's agents. And what are God's doing to Satan's agents. They are restraining them through unanswerable arguments. They are holding in check a powerful current of evil. So where is the current of evil? And she says here. So she must be pointing on the board somewhere. I think it's here where we are right now. Um, the opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third message may do its work. We are in the history of the third angel's message. And so that we can do this work, God has agents in the government holding back the tide of evil. We see that with the impeachment right now. Hey? So when the loud cry shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working. And some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. So in this history, we're not talking about this movement. God's agents and Satan's agents or some nebulous force. We're talking about US politics and two groups within US politics that, be, that between midnight cry and the shut door are pulling from opposite ends. Satan's agents are bringing about a current of evil and what is acting as a restraint. Why is it that in this history we are tracing the events of an internal civil war? Because one is a tide of evil and one is a restraint to the tide of evil. Why is it that in 2018, in October, we predicted that in this history there would be an impeachment? Why do we see an impeachment here? 
because there is one side that is working to restrain the tide of evil. People don't like it when we call that restraint the agents of God, but we don't do that Ellen White does, that in the great controversy, people identified as God's agents. They are the ones, the ones on the right side of the argument, those impeaching Donald Trump, by and large, 99% of them Democrats, who have the only hope of accepting the truth and joining God's movement when the final warning is given. Some of them will accept it. Some of those one Democrat side, not, wait, some of those on Democrat side, not Republicans. She is identifying externally two streams of information and they are putting that restraint on Donald Trump right in the history where we see him taking over the Supreme Court, taking over the different branches of government. I want us to look at one quote further down within the great controversy. It's just the first sentence of 611 paragraph three. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. When did the great work of the gospel close on our reform line of the priest? 2019. When does it begin? When would we say that this work began? 1989. That is when I would suggest began that work if we were to take that phrase over to our reform line and images to the board okay so it's this image she's going to be talking about um, i want to use that phrase and i don't want to talk about the internal because we can see that we are ending the way we began but i want us to see the external the way the internal came about is the way the internal, wait, I think one of these is supposed to be external, one of them is supposed to be internal, but I'm not sure which. So we'll just say the way the internal came about is the way the external came about. If we were to line up 2019 and 1989, it gives us the ability to cut our reform line. If we were to overlay the closing and the opening, what would we put here? If we have the closing, what is that way mark? 2019, so she's lining these up. Okay, um, the opening, what is that way mark? 1989. Just as it opened, so will it close. If we take that to the external, think about what we have discussed today. What would you place here that led to the close? I would like to suggest 2014. We began, what began in 2014 that led to 2019? It all began with the Sunday law and it swelled. If this is 2014, then this down here, wait, this down, this, or the opening is, um, 1979. It's 1979 that began the work that led to 1989. 2014, the work that led to 2019. In 1989, how many people do we place? Who are they? Reagan and Bush. In 2019, who are they? First the literal and then the spiritual. We have to cut our line, remember the revolutions, how many people do we place? Really, literally, it's one, symbolically. It's two people that was led out in the lines of the revolutions. It changes from one dictatorship to another dictatorship. What brought about the election of Reagan and the election of Bush? That was the work of the moral majority. They achieved their first victory when? In 1989 with the election of Ronald Reagan. The moral majority is headed by who? I want to remind us of that article we read earlier, the movement that led to 1989, this 10 year movement of the moral majority was, 
And she quotes, a patriarchal pro protest movement intended to reestablish the roles of males, males in their families, in the government and in religious institutions. It came at a time when there had been a growing effort to establish the rights of women, the rights of people of color, and the rights of the LGBTQ community. The moral majority thus represented the conservative religious reaction to those efforts. It's an example, the manifestation of their religious zeal that led to 1989. The moral majority grew primarily from fundamentalist and white evangelical Christians, although it also included conservative Catholics and mainline Protestants. It thus mobilized a broader conservative religious and political coalition than just white conservative evangelicals. There was also a Catholic involvement. Is there a Catholic involvement in this history? Steve Bannon. It's not just event evangelicals. He united with the conservative faction with, of the Catholic Church. Furthermore, it was the efforts of the moral majority and other important organizations within the board of the religious right, including focus on the family, that led to the defeat of legislations such as the Equal Rights Amendment and efforts to block further equal rights amendments within those three groups. Similar issues echo today as well presented in the guise of religious freedom for Christians. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody else want to read for a while? I'm still on, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> We hear you. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> read. Okay, cool. Thanks. It's their religious right to own slaves. It's. Oops, sorry. There we go. Sorry, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Right at the top. Yes. It's their religious right to own slaves. It's their religious right to segregate. It's their religious right to dictate their morality onto the minority. All through this history, you have them argue that it is their religious right to hold these principles. It's always that same argument. It's always connected to their religious zeal. It is not a wholly political argument. Jerry Falwell led to Reagan, led to Bush. 2015 to early of 2016, you have Jerry Falwell Jr. throw his political weight behind Donald Trump. Jerry Falwell led the evangelical right to endorse the candidacy of Donald Trump. His father united the evangelical right to endorse Ronald Reagan and had him elected. They follow the same pattern. It has been the same work with the same mindset. The same mindset that brought us Donald Trump in this history is what began our reform line at the very beginning, and it's the same issues that have galvanized them. The same issues of equality, not just race, which is evident through the right wing movement, but also their issues of equality when it comes to gender and when it comes to homosexuality. That's what led us to 1989, and it's what led us to Donald Trump in 2019. People say that everything we are teaching is politics and it's a political movement, but what they haven't identified is that all of these race issues was a manifestation of the religious zeal of the Protestant churches. What we are seeing today under Donald Trump is the exact same thing, the religious zeal of the Protestant conservative movements. So what we expect to see when we come to 2019 I want to remind us that Ellen White places us in this history. And when we talk about impeachment, we should be looking at it with our prophetic glasses on and see what God's doing. It's not just a fulfillment of a prediction we made uh, back here. What we are seeing is a fulfillment of the great controversy where we see God's agents. 
those politicians working as a restraint against the current of evil. This is a fulfillment of prophecy that goes back farther than 2018. When you When you are willing to identify it as such, you have to identify two streams of information and which agent represents which master. Okay, I guess that was the end of it. That looks like the end of it. Okay, all right. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip to article three. Thank you for reading. You're welcome. And Article 3 is on Donald Trump. So um, uh, Adriana added, um, I should have mentioned this. So in this document that e Elaine mailed out already, uh, she put in three, three articles. And this one here is revisiting the legacy of Jerry Falwell Sr. in Trump's America. And we've, t we've talked a lot about Jerry Falwell and then this is on politics of morality. And then this third one, oh, wait, sorry, that was still Falwell. This, the second one is secretive cables, fear of immigrants and the Tea Party, how the financial crisis led to the rise of Donald Trump. Okay, but we're gonna skip to the third one. It's really, I think it's interesting that, I'm so thankful that we're here today where we're at and knowing the things we know because we should have known them, it seems like, a long time ago. True, yeah. For a long time ago, long time that the Spirit of Prophecy wrote about that there would be people in government that are going to be holding back, restraining what is right. going on. And, and we can see it. We can see it. And we, and had we really understood Babylon and the Protestants and the Republicans and all the links and all of this stuff, even, even if we didn't understand all the prophecies, you know, and all that was going on in 1989, the connection in God we trust, even if we didn't understand that, we should have seen that one side is going to be doing one thing and one side is going to be doing another. Right. We didn't look at it that way. Right. Now, now that we do know it, it's all happening and we're seeing it clearly as it's happening and playing out in front of our face. It, it's still hard to convince other people though, you know, because like, you know, I, I see what like, for example, um, Alexandria. So I, I see what she's doing and the, the cool things that she's trying to bring up. Right. And so I try to talk to somebody about it, you know, like what she's doing. And the first thing out of this person's mouth is I hate her. Because she, you know, this and that and this and that, like, okay, no talking to you. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say that. It's like, I don't know. They just, you just it, there's... It, it goes down to what I was saying to Adriana that day that, um, that there are that certain things are going to trigger them to shut them down, right, shut them off from listening to you right away. Yeah. But if we have the and, opportunity to somehow introduce and there are other things to introduce but one especially for adventists to introduce the the history of the um in god we trust and the steps that that took to lead you to 1979 you know through the, through the civil war through the 50s through to the to 79 89 mm -hmm. that, yeah. that that might be more doable for them rather than because they're all taking their public opinion and when you go through the in god we trust back door so to speak you're not hitting on these people that the, the media is just, you know, saying what they're saying. And, you know, you're trying to reach people without bypass of what the media is teaching them. Right. Okay. That totally makes sense. Right. Cause the, it, all of her hate was based on what she was learning from the media. Yeah. Okay. And it was based on one incident and she makes it sound like it happens every single day. It's like, yeah, it's not it happened might, one time. Yeah. And some of it might be also their own personal beliefs and whatever. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I did. I digress. Okay. So article three, part one, uh, like father, like son, uh, autonomy of a young power broker by Wayne Barrett. And um, if anybody else is wanting to read, I'm, I'm open to let anybody else read. I'll read a little bit. Okay. Donald Trump, 
the 32-year-old self-proclaimed real estate colossus price tagged at $200 million. The brash streetwise son of Brooklyn's largest apartment building transplanted from his father's box-like office at the Avenue Z tip of the borough to the Fifth Avenue penthouse bounded on both sides by his own stunning Manhattan ventures. The New York Times puffs him as the city's number one real estate promoter of the mid 70s, the William Zeckendorf of hard times. But the most accurate description of Trump's real estate genius was contained in a deposition from a four year old Philadelphia bankruptcy court file. When a Penn Central, I think that's Pennsylvania, right? Central representative was asked why he contacted Trump alone out of his list of developers. It was uppermost in our minds that the developer be very high in his political position. Trump is doing that in our judgment. If anyone can do, he can do. A no money down exclusive option to buy the two largest tracts of undeveloped land left in Manhattan, 144 acres of unused railroad tracks along the Hudson River from 30th to 39th Street and from 59th to 72nd Streets. His transformation of the 30th Street Yards from the long-rejected Convention Center site into an, an acceptable $400 million project that Trump used to call his Miracle City Center. His vision of a co-op city-sized development on the 60th Street Yards, now pared down by community pressure to a Manhattan version of his father's 4,000-unit Brooklyn project, Trump Village. The new project is to be surrounded by lucrative commercial space as his father had done before him. His packaging of the most extraordinary structure of city and state tax breaks ever arranged, camouflaged as an $80 million hotel and now rising one politically negotiated pain at a time as the as the glass enclosed Hyatt replacement of the Commodore at 42nd Street in Lexington Avenue. And that movie that I was watching, it shows this, and maybe somebody is more knowledgeable on this than me, but he, but he fought for a tax abatement. And I didn't know what, I haven't looked it up, so I just caught from what the movie was saying. I wanted to look up what a tax abatement really means, but, but I know what they defined it in the movie was that the, this hotel, he would not have to pay the city taxes for 40 years. And that was um, allowing him to, maybe somebody knows better details how to say it, um, to be able to fund this, this get loans and fund this, um, this project where he did the replacement of the Commodore and turned it into the Hyatt. Um, so just the, just the base part of that, that he wouldn't have to pay taxes on it for 40 years. <laughs> I mean, how would anybody else like to have that kind of revenue coming in and you don't pay taxes on it? That's amazing. And then he goes and does it again later with uh, Mayor Koch and goes head to head with him. And then, um, and then later again, I think with the Taj Mahal, he tries to do the same thing. Probably not, and when I he wonder. didn't get what he wanted, um, he had along the lines met Cohen. Everybody's heard about him. And um, then he went and used Cohen when he needed help. And did the bullying or whatever he did to get it to go through. I wonder what he has to do, what he has to promise to get a deal like that. I, I don't know. They, that's why they called him. He had the, said he was made of gold and had the Midas touch and everything he touched turned to gold. Gold for him, but not for anybody else. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Trump's problem is not so much what he, and, and for the way the movie portrays it is at that time, and I, I'm unfamiliar with anything about back in New York, but um, that it was really in a bad way, New York was, um, poor, bankrupt. Um, I don't know if bankrupt is the right word to use for it, but it was, New York was just a mess, financially a mess, and had over, what do you call it, um, indulged in all the spending and now it's all crashing down. And so it's all a mess. And he's offering to go in there and be the hero, if I understood what was going on, to, to, bring, um, to bring 
you know, the, what he was doing was going to bring more people in as far as I could understand it, but he wound up catering to the, to the, to the wealthy and the rich. But, but so the abatement had something to do with what he was going to bring to the city and what he was, so what he so-called put, you know, he's laying on the line of his own self to be able to bring this to the city, something along those lines. Maybe somebody else can better explain it or has better understanding of it than I do. So Trump's problem is not so much what he's done, but how he's done it. I decided at the start that I wanted to profile him by describing his deals, not his lifestyle or his personality. After getting to know him, I realized that his deals are his life. He once told me I won't make a deal just to make a profit. It has to have flair. Another man <clears throat> Manhattan developer said it differently. Trump won't do a deal unless there's something extra, a kind of moral larceny in it. He's not satisfied with a profit. He has to take something more. Otherwise, there's no thrill. In this, the first of two part series, I'll examine the character and history of Trump's Brooklyn base. In the second, I'll trace the details that led to his extraordinary acquisitions of the three Manhattan properties. So maybe we're going to hear it in this. Um, and the government negotiations that are turning them into personal windfalls. Each history, the Brooklyn Empire, the Manhattan purchases, and the government contracts is a tale of overreaching and abuse of power. Wow, that sounds familiar, huh? Like his father, Donald Trump has pushed each deal to the limit, taking from it whatever he can get, turning political connections into private profits at public expense. And, and then they show too with the Taj Mahal, when he did the Taj Mahal, that he totally overspent. There was a guy that went publicly uh, an analyst or somebody that publicly had made a public statement that it was never going to turn a profit and um, said some other things about it. And that, um, and people were saying that he made, I don't know if they want to, if they said bad deals, but he, did, he didn't negotiate well. And he wound up at one point in time, I think it was on the Taj Mahal with this billion dollar, whatever it was, or 600 million something loan at a 14% rate and he buried himself um, in trying to do it. Um, and then when he went bankrupt, which was great, he got to walk away, but all the people that had been doing the work, all the contractors, all the laborers, everybody, nobody got paid and he just walked away. So Abe Beam, the connections, Abe Beam, whose municipal Largret, Largus, to the Brooklyn organization that spawned him was cut short by the city's fiscal collapse, has left the Trump penetration of Manhattan as the only tangible sign of his administration's Brooklyn base. Bean had known Trump's family for 30 years. They'd eaten the same clubhouse dinners at the same annual dances given by the borough's regulars. Like Bean and most other polls who came up through the local machines, Fred Trump owed his biggest breaks to the country's party, party, party organization. In the beginning, Donald Trump used Beam's closest political associates, publicist Howard Rubenstein, lobbyist lawyer and fundraiser, Abraham Bunny Lind Lindenbaum, and Bunny's son Sandy, now part of a large Manhattan law firm as the major political brokers on his Manhattan projects. But the Trumps were too shrewd to rely on the power of the Beam brokers. There were con contributions too. Beam's recollections of the Trump firm's donations were hazy. But the former mayor did say, I don't know if he, Trump, gave and when he gave, but he's a friend of mine. I know he tried to help every time. What does seem clear is that Donald's success is acquiring, in acquiring and developing the Commodore, the convention center site, the convention center site, and to a lesser degree, the 60th street yards was in part due to Beam's support. It was the Brooklyn crowd at work, said one top city official. Hugh Carey, another product of Brooklyn politics, was virtually turned a state agency, the Urban Development Corporation, into a temporary Trump subsidiary. UDC is developing Trump's hotel convention center, and some new projects, including a multi-million dollar renovations of Grand Central Terminal. But as Kerry has done for Trump, 
So Trump has done for the governor to the tune of nearly $125,000 in campaign contributions from the family and their companies, $35,000 in 74, 66,578, plus a $23,000 share of a loan totaling $300,000, a group venture with an inner circle of other carry financiers, including lawyer Bill Shee, MTA chairman Harold Fisher, realtor Sylvan Lawrence, and, and ILA, International Longshoremen's Association, leader Anthony Scotto, the only individual to have exceeded Trump's election year generosity was the governor's oil rich brother. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. You or can you take over. Huh? I said you can take over. Yeah. He, so you can see that he's been using and manipulating politics from the very start. Yes. So yes. if you're, if you're going to say now he's the president and he's changed, and he, he's, this is politics now. This is not like his old businesses like he used to, you know, this is politics. Well, his old businesses all revolved around manipulating politics. Yes. This it's is nothing new. Right. A lot of people, I think, would do great to read this article because it shows who he was back in the day. Yes. Anyway, so um, I met in case the donations, right? That's correct, yes. In case the donations weren't enough, Trout portrayed Chief, Chief Carey fundraiser Luis M. Sunshine as his director of special projects and registered ha her as his Albany lobbyist for the Convention Center plan. Additionally, Sunshine accompanies Trump to meetings at various government agencies throughout the state. When asked what she does on such trips, one official remarked, she just hands, she just hands, I'm pretty sure I meant to say stands. Why? She just stands around, gets a document if it's needed, calls the governor. During the three years she's worked for Trump, Sunshine has directed Kerry's campaign finances, first paying off the governor's substantial 1974 debt and then serving as his executive director of finance for the 1978 campaign. She was rewarded with $17,000 a year, one meeting a month job as vice chairman of the state thruway authority and a position with the job development authority. Although the latter post carries no salary, it does provide up to 5,000 in expenses and $34 million worth of industrial loans to administer. For Trump, the donations are the glue that holds together the public private, private relationships. So the donations. Follow the donations, like that president's men deep throat, follow the money. This is his glue. So the developer sees his company's political contributions as part of the cost of doing government business. For tax purposes, most of the money is supplied as corporate contributions. For Trump, the donations are the glue that holds together the public-private relationship, he reiterated. Although Trump says he joined the 1974 Kerry campaign early because, quote, I knew he was a winner, unquote, he hedged his bets pretty carefully. Ken Aletta, then campaign manager for Kerry's primary opponent, Howard Samuels, recalls, quote, I got a call from Trump. He said he wanted me as a Samuels staff person to know that he'd contributed $10,000 to Samuels just so I'd know who he was, if her, if there, if he ever called. I usually kept far away from the finance end of it, but I checked this donation and he'd made it, unquote. Besides the $125,000 donation to, donated to Carrie, Trump owned firms, Trump owned firms have recently contributed an additional $34,000 to city and state candidates and positions to affect his Manhattan projects. So he donated to the people that would have an effect on his development projects. $10,000 to Ed Koch, the Koch. 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 Yeah, Ed Koch, he was the mayor. He Was it Koch? Yeah, Koch. He actually, Trump, not Koch, um, he brags about how he's donated to all these political things. You know, I've heard him brag about 
how much he contributes, talks about it when he's, you know, getting hit on his taxes and all that kind of stuff. I've heard him make statements that he brags about, but look at why he's done it. He's always done it to benefit himself. Yeah. So after Beam lost um, $5,500 to Beam, $4,000 to Mario Cuomo, $10,000 to State Senator Manfred um, Orenstein's personal or Democratic Senate campaign committees, $2,000 to City Control, uh, Comptroller Harrison Golden, um, $2,000 to City Council President Carol Bellamy, and $200 to City Planning Commissioner Robert Wagner Jr. After Manhattan Councilman Henry Stern led the opposition to his Commodore tax abatement scheme, Trump called and offered Stern a contribution. I declined, said the councilman. Few others have. Finally, Trump has retained Roy Cohen as advisor on each of his major deals, on a host of legal actions, and as a conduit to the upper reaches of power, public and private. In recent years, Cohn and Sunshine have replaced the Lindenbaum and Rubenstein as young Trump's primary resources and agents. The Manhattan hard sell has, suppl has supplanted the friendly shrewd understated style of the old Bro Brooklyn days. So the Brooklyn base. Abe Beam met Fred Trump in the 1940s when Trump tried to sell him a single family home he'd build um, on Remsen Avenue in the East Flatbush section of Brooklyn. The middleman on the transaction, predictably, was Bunny Lindenbaum, Fred uh, Trump's lawyer and Beam's oldest and closest friend. Beam and Lindenbaum had begun their political careers together as captains in Brooklyn's Madison Club, also the political base of two assembly speakers, Irwin and Stanley St Stangut. Beam, who worked in the city's budget office, from 1945 until 1961 said he continued to see Trump over the years at political and social events, including the annual dinner dances of the Brooklyn Democratic Organization and the fundraising functions of various Brooklyn clubhouses, Lyndon Bond told me. That relationship developed because both of them were close friends of mine. I've represented Trump for 40 years. The relationship ultimately meant money for Fred Trump. In 1960, both Beam and Lindenbaum participated in the Board of Estimate decision that shaped Trump's largest real estate project, the development of Trump Village. That year, the nonprofit United Housing Foundation had received City Planning Commission, CPC, approval for a tax abatement to build a major housing cooperative off Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. Publicly, Trump attacked the abatement as a giveaway. The taxpayers of the borough of Brooklyn should not be asked to subsidize more luxurious housing than they themselves enjoy. Not long afterward, he reversed himself and applied for the abatement. According to Lindenbaum, I went to see Wagner and talked to him. Then I took Brooklyn Borough President John Cashmore out to Trump's building and persuaded him it, it the, UF, the UHF project was giveaway. He, supposed, he supported us. Trump's proposal also won the support of the then budget director, Abe Beam. Lindenbaum recalls that the man who finally settled the dispute was Robert Moses. Though he'd already resigned from the CPC and had no official connection with the issue, he'd sat and listened to the both sides, said Lindenbaum. Then he suggested the split. Trump wound up with two thirds of the site, UHF the rest. Though years later, UHF, Trump, Lindenbaum, and others would testify at a state investigation commission hearing on the Trump project, no one ever mentioned Moses' role. Two months after Trump got his sight, Wagner appointed Lindenbaum to Moses' seat on the CPC. Lindenbaum remembers the senior Trump as a guest on one famous political luncheon, the 1961 fundraiser for um, Scackley's restaurant on Montague Street in Brooklyn, where Lindenbaum gathered 43 builders and landlords who did business with the city. Each pledged campaign contributions for the honored guest, Mayor Wagner, and Trump's $2,500 contribution was among the largest. The resulting front page flat cost Lindenbaum his planning commission post and became a, mayor, a major issue in the 1961 mayoral campaign. Nonetheless, Wagner was reelected re and with him, Abe Beam, became camp troller, comptroller. troller. In 1966, the Fred Trump-Bunny-Lindenbaum relationship became a major city scandal. 
The State Investigations Commission, after extensive public and private hearings, issued a report on the handling of Trump Village's $60 million Mitchell Lama mortgage and prompted the commission chairman, Jacob Grumet, Grumet to publicly assail Trump, Lindenbaum, et cetera, all, et cetera, all of them. So as grasping and greedy individuals and asked housing finance, finance officials is there any way of preventing a man who does business in that way from getting another contract with the state? The main findings of the investigation were Trump retained McNeil Mitchell, the East Side Senator who'd written the Mitchell Lama legislation. The developer paid Mitchell $128,000 in legal fees. Trump also retained Lyndon Baum on the project and tried to pay him a $520,000 $20,000 legal fee out of the mortgage funds. State housing officials who testified at the hearing characterized the fee as uncon unconscionable and outrageous. When press Lindenbaum's firm claimed it had spent 4,500 hours in court at condemnation trials, but an assistant corporation counsel swore in an affidavit that his office had handled every condemnation on the Trump site. The transcript contains the following exchange. Commissioner, when you said you were engaged in the trial of a commendation proceeding, it, it's my impression that you were trying the case. Lindenbaum, oh no, I'm sorry, I was an observer. Commissioner, you sat there? Lindenbaum, I sat there. Then Lindenbaum submitted a 60 page list of tenants and claimed that his firm had handled their, disp uh, the, their dispossessments, evictions, and relocations. But the representative of a private relocation firm testified that Lindenbaum had simply copied the list from his records, that a blanket dispossesses notice for all tenants had been handled by his office, so that no tenants were evicted, and that his office had handled all relocations. Trump overestimated his cost on the project by $8 million. Eventually, he was forced to return his $1.2 million overestimate on the land, but not until he'd used part of the money to buy the site for a nearby shopping center, avoiding the expenditure of a nickel of his own money. Moreover, since the builder's fees is based on his estimated not real cost, Trump took what the state commission called a windfall, $600,000 profit on top of his already handsome $3.2 million fee. Trump created an equipment rental company for the job, failed to disclose his ownership of the corporation, and then billed the state at rates far in excess of normal fees. For example, he charged $21,000 rent on a dump truck only valued at $3,600. He billed the housing companies another $8,280 for two tile scrapers, which together were valued at $1,000 and $9,600 for a $3,500 truck and so on. Further, field reports demonstrate that much of this same equipment was being used to build Fred Trump's nearby shopping center and was being falsely build on the housing companies. The Investigations Commission cited that this is an example of Fred Trump's talent for getting every ounce of profit out of his housing project. It is a talent that he passed on to his son. Fred Trump, irritated at being questioned about the rentals, characterized them as peanuts. <laughs> like father, like son. As a result of the investigation, part of Trump's and Lindenbaum's payments were withheld, but years later, arbitrators awarded full payment to both. Trump even won a claim for the interest he'd lost in the interval. Though Lindenbaum was paid through the city, then Comptroller Beam can't recall having ever audited the controversial claim. I asked Donald Trump about the issues raised by the commission. I stand by everything we did on that job, he said. Trump Village is the most successful Mitchell Lama job ever. There's never been a vacant apartment or a tenant protest. It's the highest voting district in the state of New York. Trump Village was the last project Fred Trump built. In 1965, he acquired Coney Island Steel Steeple Chase site, sought to redevelop it as a housing project, and ran up against the Lindsay administration's interest in creating an amusement park there. In 1969, the city took the land from Trump in a condemnation proceeding. This time, Bunny Lindenbaum did not just sit. He got a $3.8 million price on land Trump had purchased for $2.5 million only four years before. The city's never done anything with the site. 
We stopped building and started acquiring then, explains Donald Trump. Trump the building became uh, Trump the building became Trump the management firm. It is clear that while the company's properties are surely vast, they are exceeded by those of other landlords. The assessed value of the Trump holdings are varied considerably. Today, Donald hints at a figure well in excess of the $200 million estimate he offered the Times in 1976. He says the firm has acquired highly profitable land in Las Vegas and Southern California, but Business Week quoted an independent valuation of $100 million. In the financial institutions backing Donald, Donald Hyatt deal, zero with Fred as guarantor of the loans. Took 18 months to decide that the Trump the Trumps were an acceptable risk. Indeed, Fred Trump started Trump Village as a private job in 1960, and though he'd been in the business 20 years, he couldn't get private financing. In his interviews with me, Donald Trump repeatedly repeatedly suggested that the firm was an awesome force in the industry. He also claimed that his convention center and hotel would be the largest in the country. They will not be real estate entrepreneur, they will not be. Real estate entrepreneurs do their own ad advertising and Trump has a way of doubling or shaving every number when it suits him. Something he still does today. This is where he gets a little bit from. In interviews, Donald Trump has laid claim to 22,000 22, units in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, Virginia, Washington, DC, and New Jersey. But his testimony in federal court put the total figures around 12,000 units actually owned and managed. Whatever the size or exact dollar value, however, there is no question about the racial, economic, and sexual character of the Trump holdings. This would be important. Let me highlight that. Tenants are mostly white. People receiving welfare do not live in Trump-owned apartments. Households with substantial male incomes do. The race case. Under the Federal Housing Act, the U.S. Justice Department Civil Rights Division brought a landmark complaint against the Trump organizations in 1973. The suit charged that the Trumps refused to rent to Blacks. After a year and a half of furious legal and rhetorical combat, the Trumps in 1975 agreed to a consent decree described as one of the most far-reaching ever negotiated. It required Trump to advertise vacancies on a prefer preferential basis with the opening housing center of the Urban League. Last March, the Justice Department complained that Trump was in contempt of consent decree and filed pending motions in Brooklyn federal court to compel compliance. The new complaint charges that racially discriminatory conduct by Trump against agents has occurred with such frequency that, um, I'm gonna say that was an, it has created a substantial impediment to the full enjoyment of equal opportunity. The evidence for the original charge against Trump was largely obtained through Urban League testers, white and black who sought apartments in various Trump-owned complexes. Whites got them, Blacks didn't. The case was also based on a series of individual complaints to Eleanor Holmes Norton, then chairperson of the city's Human Rights Commission. Norton resolved a half dozen individual cases by compelling Trump to admit Black complainants. She asked the federal government to look for a pattern, but perhaps the most compelling evidence came from Trump employees and former employees. Um, is there anyone who could take over reading real quick for a little bit? I can. According to court records, four superintendents or rental agents confirmed that applications sent to the central office for acceptance or rejection were coded by race. Three doormen were told to discourage blacks from who came seeking apartments when the manager was out, either by claiming no vacancies or hiking up the rents. A super said he was instructed to send black applicants to the central office, but to accept white applications on site. Another rental agent said that Fred Trump had instructed him not to rent to blacks. Further, the agent said Trump wanted to decrease the number of black tenants already in the development by encouraging them to locate housing somewhere or elsewhere. Donald Trump charged 
in the press that the suit was part of a nationwide drive to force owners of moderate and luxury apartments to rent to welfare, welfare recipients. We are not going to be forced by anyone to put people in our buildings to the detriment of tenants who have for many years lived in these buildings raised families in them and who plan to continue to live there. They would be reverse discrimination, he said. The government is not going to experiment with our buildings to the detriment of ourselves and the thousands who live in them now. Trump's attorney, Roy Cohn, filed an equally shrilly, wait, the equally shrill affidavit with the court charging that the government sought to capitulation of the defendants and the substitution of the welfare department for the management corporation. In March 1974, Donald Trump testified as president of many of the Trump housing companies. He assumed a colorblind posture throughout much of the questioning, claiming he had no idea of the racial composition of his tenants or employees. He lapsed when he described an all black job in Washington and conceded that the company owned projects that were 100% white. He was, he continued unfamiliar with the Fair Housing Act of 1969 and said that the company had made no charges in its rental policies since the law's passage. He claimed that the only test of tenant eligibility was that the tenant's rent should not exceed 25% of his income. He testified that we don't generally include the wife's income. We like to see if for the male in the family. Then he changed his testimony the next day to try to include some assessment of the wife's, inc wife's income. Cohn explained to Cohn explained the Trump policy of only advertising apartment vacancies in the Times. We think the Times is geared to minorities. It supported a Puerto Rican for mayor against a Jew. In October 1974, Cohn filed a motion to dismiss the case and charged in an ironic reversal of his earlier McCarthy days that federal agents were engaging in Gestapo-like tactics against his client. Cohn's affidavit described the agents as stormtroopers. In the court, he said the Trumps were being subjected to un undercover agents going in and out of their buildings, lying as to who they are and where they are from, trying to trap somebody into saying or doing something. The judge found Cohn's charges utterly without foundation and said, this is the first time anyone's charged FBI agents in a civil matter with Gestapo-type uh, Gestapo conduct. Cohn, who fundraises for the J. Edgar Hoover Foundation, suddenly switched. I have never brought a charge against the FBI in my life. I have personal reasons why I haven't, and I never would. My relationship is much too close. The, the disastrous failure of the dismissal motion, which may have been prompted more by what the agents were finding than how they were looking, was the last Trump offense offensive in the case. A few months later, the firm settled the decree. Trump's press statement at the settlement was an unrestricted structured version of the release the company sent out when the case began. He said the agreement satisfied the firm because it did not contain any requirements that would compel the Trump organization to accept persons on welfare as tenants. I asked Donald Trump why he stopped advertising vacancies in the Amster Amsterdam news when the two-year court mandate had expired. It's a neighborhood paper for Harlem, he said. I've interviewed a couple of dozen people from about Trump in and out of government. Many had vague awareness of the charges against him, but no one seemed to think that the Trump race record should affect what the company gets from the city or state. 
In fact, no one had bothered to ask the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, which is handling the case for the Justice Department, just what the facts are. Trump had pro has proposed housing on the west side, perhaps the most integrated neighborhood in the city. He justified the city's largest in the Commodore deal partially by pointing to the long-term jobs it will generate. Trump's 1974 deposition in this case was 100 pages of uncontained contempt for the whole issue. Cohen said it, said it for him. This is a spit in the ocean. I got the sense when I interviewed him that Trump has mellowed into a low-key indifference to the suit and the issue. It has nothing to do with the profits or what he calls commercial creativity. It is not part of his real world. Neither is it for the people in government who keep making deals with him. Early in the reporting of this story, I was at the state's Urban Development Corporation reading records on Trump's Commodore deal in a conference room. No one knew I was there but some UDC officials. And I hadn't mentioned, I hadn't intended to talk to Trump until I'd learned what I could about him from documents. The phone in the office where I was working rang and the secretary said it was for me. It was Trump, buoyant over his surprise call. I hear you've been going around town asking a lot of negative questions about me. When are you going to talk to me? He asked. I'm circling, I said. I'm back. Okay. So. Um, but isn't it that whole race issue? You can see that it had already its roots back then. And he was under investigation for it. So how everyone, how it got erased from everyone's mind who does pay attention to the stuff, I don't know. But right. you had, what's her name, Paula White on The Baker Show saying that he was, he has never been a racist. And I'm like, if you don't know history, you wouldn't know, but you have, that's the thing is what we're learning is you have to look at the old paths of history. Right. So <clears throat> I met him three times after the call, twice in his Manhattan apartment and once at my ins in insistence in his Avenue Z office, still the base of the Trump organization but not where Trump likes to entertain reporters. Donald is embarrassed by his Brooklyn roots. One of, one of his business associates told me, he uses Manhattan as his business address to put distance between himself and Avenue Z. When I asked Bunny Lindenbaum what he thought of Donald's and his own son's uh, preoccupation with Manhattan, his voice rose. They went to, to do their work in Manhattan. I was born in Brooklyn. I always practiced in Brooklyn. I still live in Brooklyn. I still have my office in Brooklyn. They can't take Brooklyn out of me. Wealth is supposed to convey an, an enviable status. I rode with Trump through Manhattan in his double car length silver chauffeured Cadillac with its DJT plates while he talked about how um, I don't even know what I was supposed to say. Oh, how, okay. That's what it was. How hard New York is on a developer, how communities fight him, how other cities want him. Through 30 blocks of slow Manhattan traffic, not a single New Yorker peered into the back of the carpeted limo. The West Side groups who'd challenged him on his grandiose housing plans for the 60th Street Yard had placed demands on his wealth and we're not impressed with the symbols of it that he rushed to accumulate. Why lurch through Manhattan streets in an expensive advertisement of one's wealth if no one even notices? Until the last couple of weeks, when he became uneasy about what I'd been doing, Trump would call me for progress reports on my story, tell me he'd say, you finding out what we've been doing is good for the city? What do people say about me? Do they say I work hard? But at the last interview, before I began my questions, he went through a prepared speech about his reputation. I really value my reputation and I don't hesitate to sue. I've sued twice for libel. Roy Cohen's been my attorney both times. I've won once and the other case is pending. It's cost me $100,000, but it's worth it. 
I've broken one rider. You and I have been, uh, and you and I have been friends and all. But if your story damages my reputation, I want you to know I'll sue. Then back to the smile. But everything will be all right. We're going to get together after the story. He's amazing. Yeah. There was a another section in that movie. I can't remember who the guy was, but he was a. Uh... Oh, he was one of the guys that won on The Apprentice. And he said when he went into, when he first went to the job, he went into Trump's office. And as they were talking or whatever was going on, Trump continued to, to he was looking through things and he was, kept pulling up these post-it tags. And he didn't know what he was doing. And he finally, I think he actually asked him, or he looked and saw what he was doing. He had stacks and stacks of, of magazines and newspapers and things like that. And staff marks them with post-it notes where there's articles written about him. And so he sits and reads about himself. And, that, and this guy said that he really likes to read about himself. It's just like, he's really bizarre. Uh, it's crazy. He's like um, the old stereotype of a crazy Hollywood diva. Do you know what exactly. I mean? Yeah. The narcissist obsessed yeah. with themselves, crazy about attention and being portrayed the way they want, they think they are or should be portrayed. And he he and Ivana Bull fed the their their favorite media um, through what was going on with them. And then with the Marla Maples thing, one of those uh, news reporters, I can't remember which one she was one of the writers, she called and wanted to, I don't know, get a story or whatever about with stuff that was going on, something that had gone on with Marla. And when they, when he um, dumped her basically. And, and he talked to, I guess, his assistant or a secretary or something. And she said, you'll get a call back in five minutes. And so the, the reporter says, oh good, you know, so she sure enough gets that call back in five minutes and she recorded the call. And it was somebody said, he said his name was John Miller, I think it was. And he goes on to talk about what happened with Marla and why this and why that and da 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 da. And I think, I can't remember if that was where he, I, I don't remember what all he said in there. But, anyways, but, anyways, after, you know, she breaks that call up and she's talking, you're hearing her, you know, give this testimony now, currently, or whenever the movie was done. And, and she recorded it and she let other people hear it. And she said, that's Donald Trump. It was him that called back and pretended to be somebody else and was <laughs> saying all this information. He can't get enough of himself. That's, that is really insane. It, it yeah. is. And, and that's who we elect. Well, not we, but that's who the, this nation elected in to be president. Wow. That's scary yeah so <clears throat> he'd been working uh gentler versions of this carrot and stick approach since the first interview when i arrived at his apartment the first time he opened with the voice that's owned by murdoch right don coomerfeld is running murdoch's operations right you know the former deputy mayor he's a good friend of mine at our very first meeting, he'd been, he even began talking about someone he'd threatened with a slander suit over a harmless comment. When he found out I lived in the battered Brownsville section of Brooklyn, he called to say, I could get you an apartment, you know. That must be an awfully tough neighborhood. I told him I'd lived there for 10 years and worked as a community organizer, so he shifted to another form of identification. So we do the same thing, he said. We're both rebuilding neighborhoods. And again, we're going to have to rely, really get to know each other after this article. Trump was testing me to see what would work, convicted, convinced that either fear or the suggestion that I could have some undefined future relationship with his wealth or his influence could help shape the story. He only had to figure out what I wanted. Every relationship is a transaction. So when you hear people, because you, you, I've heard people say on the media that say, that say the only thing Trump understands in relationships is that he understands them as a transaction. 
And I think it all stems, like they get a lot from this article. So this is where he says, every relationship is a transaction. He told me that he'd had to move from a prior Manhattan apartment because a reporter had printed his address. The rich are supposed to insist on privacy, right? But the Times had photographed him in the living room of one prior address and he's used the other at the top of his business letterhead. The next time I saw him, he said he'd moved because he'd lived across from Gucci and that was no place to raise his new son. Now he lives across from Central Park. His, ten his tendency to view things to his own advantage was made clear to me when I asked him about campaign contributions. He told me he had not contributed to Beam's 1977 campaign. To do so, he said, would have been a conflict because of the Commodore and Convention Center deals. But I found $5,000 in Trump company contributions to the Beam deficit filed at the Board of, the, of Elections in 1978. He angrily denied that he'd ever given a dime to Orhenstein individually or to his campaign for Senate majority and threatened to sue anyone who said he did. The Trump organization was among the largest contributors to Orenstein individually one year and helped bankroll his campaign for Senate majority. Does he lapse into his fiercest denial when he just doesn't know? When I confronted him on the Beam and Orenstein contributions, he said the donations must have come from his father. Similarly, in his de deposition in the federal discrimination case, Trump refused to acknowledge responsibility for accepting or rejecting individual tenants. Those statements were a material part of his testimony since they went to the heart of the case. Trump's ability to control the discriminatory practices of his companies. Shortly after he'd given his de deposition, he was interviewed by a field investigator for the Secretary of State. <coughs> The interview had nothing to do with the federal case. The investigator was trying to determine if Trump met the experience requirement for a real estate broker's license. The report states, Mr. Trump further stated that he supervises and controls the renting of all apartments owned by the Trump organization. During many interview with applicant, he showed me hundreds of files. Each contained numerous leases, both of commercial and residential tenants and rental records, all of which contained applicant signatures and handwriting. So you have him in court in a deposition where it's asking, were you responsible for being discriminatory against tenants? Were you the one who chose them? And he said, absolutely, I had nothing to do with him. Then someone asks him, all right, did you have anything to do with your tenants because it requires that you have experience for this job you want? And he says, absolutely, I, had, I did all the work with my tenants. So he just flips the switch on whatever he needs to match whatever he wants. So Trump's lawyer, Matthew Toasty, also claimed in a letter to the Secretary of State that Trump had negotiated numerous leases for apartments. Yet he testified in federal court, government, this is government talking, do you ever have anything to do with rental decisions in individual cases? Trump, no, I really don't. Donald Trump is a user of other users. The politician and his mo money change changer feed on each other. The money changer trades private dollars for access to public ones. Trump, Sunshine, Lindenbaum, and their counterparts, Carrie and Bean, are classic expressions of this relationship. The transactions that result are contained in the father's story of Trump Village and in next week's account of Trump's Manhattan conquests. So that's part one. Let's go to part two. Um, behind the 70s era deals that made Donald Trump by Wayne Barrett. Black and white, okay. Editors, no, this is the second of two, okay. Down a little bit. So Donald Trump cuts the cards, the deals of a young power broker by Wayne Barrett. This is the profit. This is the prof, the profile of a power broker at work. It is also the deal by deal account of a $400 million convention center site was um, convention. Center site was acquired and selected. Next to Westway, the convention center has been New York's single largest development issue of this decade. At center stage is Donald Trump, the young man who managed the land deals, profiting by his relationship with a mayor and a governor. He has left a trail of trade-offs behind him that is in a city where pol political brokers learn to cover their tracks ex exceptionally clear. It is a November day in Philadelphia, 1974. 
on sale in a federal bankruptcy court are the largest undeveloped tracts of land left in Manhattan. The West Side Rail Yards stretching along the western front from 30th to 39th Street and 59th to 72nd Streets. One of these properties, the 30th Street parcel, has since become the designated site for the city's convention center. The other is being promoted as a 5,000 unit housing project surrounded by parks and a shopping area. The seller is the bankrupt Penn Central Transportation Company, PCTC, which is attempting to reorganize itself by turning its real estate portfolio into capital. The buyer is Donald Trump, then 28 years old, the son of Brooklyn's largest apartment builder. The Trump per pro Trump proposes to build up to 30,000 units of partially subsidized housing on the sites. He seeks an exclusive option on the property and offers Penn Central the promise that he will obtain the required zoning changes and taxpayer subsidies to guarantee a minimum land pur purchase price of $62 million, the least he expects to obtain in government mortgage funds. Trump's firm advances no cash. But of course, without City Hall's cooperation, this remarkable proposal would have remained just that. Trump's father, Fred, had known Abe Beam, then the mayor, for some 30 years and had been a campaign contributor for 20. The firm is tied to the same Brooklyn Democratic machine which spawned Beam's political career. Trump's attorney, Bunny Lindenbaum, seated beside him in the courtroom that morning, is Beam's oldest and closest friend. Penn Central representatives began negotiating with Trump two weeks after Beam became mayor. Trump's option is scheduled to end when Beam's term is up. There can be no misunderstanding. Trump in that Philadelphia courtroom was executing a political option. Edward Eichler, who had represented the railroad in its negotiations with Trump, explained what had led to the acceptance of Trump's proposal. In a 150-page deposition, he said the railroad had had lists of real estate brokers, developers, and attorneys who were interested in the sites, but PCTC chose not to contact any of them. It seemed self-evident that they would be interested, he said, but, but Penn Central had to find a developer who was very, very high in his political position, who we proceeded to make a judgment as, which, as to which one we thought would be best, and we judged that Trump would. The basis for that judgment, at least in part, could have been a meeting Trump had arranged some months prior to submitting his proposal. Present were Abe Beam, Trump and his father, and Eichler. According to Donald Trump, I called the mayor because Penn Central wanted to know whether or not the city was interested in developing the land. The mayor said his administration would be. Eichler told me that Beam had indicated he'd known the family and that it was a good organization. Further, Eichler said Penn Central was looking for the developer who seemed best positioned in the New York market to get re rezoning and government, rezoning and government financing. He emphasized that zoning is a highly political activity in the city of New York and that there had not been a res rezoning of this magnitude on a piece of property this politically sensitive in the recent history of the city. There are going to be opponents from the neighborhood, Eichler continued, who have already stated that they are going to oppose anything but very low densities. They're going to oppose at very high buildings and view blocking and the real swing is value, in value is to a high density. Trump was selected to transcend these petty community interests. After all records on file with the Board of Standards and Appeals show that over a 10 year period, clients of his attorney, Lindenbaum, have received more zoning variances than clients of any other attorney in the city. With Beam as the new mayor, Lindenbaum's batting average was improving. But there were two other significant actors in the courtroom, drama unfolding that morning. One was Herman Getzoff, a Manhattan real estate broker who had previously worked with PCTC and had opposed the Trump transaction for months. The other was David Berger, senior partner of Berger and Montague, a Philadelphia law firm representing the stockholders and unsecured creditors of the Penn Central Company. Berger's clients whose stock had lost its value with the PCTC collapse had the strongest interest in maximizing profits from the sale of the railroad's properties. So Berger too was opposing the Trump deal. Earlier, Herman Getzoff had brought in other potential buyers. Through friends, he'd learned of the Eichler-Trump negotiations, which had been conducted in secret. 
And in July, he'd sub he had submitted to Eichler a formal offer from the Starrett Brothers um, and Econ Co., another major New York builder. According to Gatsoff, Starrett and Off had offered a $150 million purchase price for the railroad's land, as opposed to Trump's offer of a $62 million plus a share of the potential development profits. Though Gatsoff had made daily efforts to reach Eichler after the bid submission, he never did. And toward the end of July, a week after the Starrett bid had been submitted, Eichler went to court and put forth Trump's bid as the recommended proposal for of the trustees. He had not met with Starrett, though he wrote an internal memo conceding that Starrett's 30th Street offer would generate more money than the Trump deal. But he stuck with Trump because the rezoning will only be the result of an especially powerful political effort, which Trump is much more likely to pull off. How do you pull off a political effort as a business owner if you don't know people in politics, right? Then he wrote Starrett a letter suggesting it apply for other parcels. On, on August 7, Trump and Starrett's chairman Robert Olnick met. The same day Olnick withdrew the Starrett offer. According to Trump, Starrett and Trump um, are partners in Starrett City, of which we own 25%, and they own 5%. Frankly, if we hadn't put in the seven million equity, the project wouldn't have been built. We have a big relationship with Starrett Olnick, never responded to a half dozen calls from me. Getzoff then obtained the second bidder. HRH Construction Company, another housing developer, Richard Ravitch, HRH president, wrote to the court, we've been interested in developing the yards over a period of almost a decade. However, we were not advised that the trustees were considering selling the yards until after a petition was filed with a bankruptcy court. The HRH offer, like Starrett's and Trump's, was dependent on obtaining a government guaranteed mortgage to finance both the land purchase and the housing construction. The difference between Trump's proposal and the HRH Starrett offers was that neither Starrett nor HRH sought a percentage of the land profits. Trump required 15%, which meant that in fact, Penn Central would only get 85% of the sale price. Another difference was that neither Starrett nor HRH demanded the, that Penn Central put the bill for $750,000 worth of risk capital investment to be used to develop the project. Trump did. What Trump offered the railroad that Starrett and HRH did not was an option for the company to pay for and obtain an equity interest in the projects eventually built. According to HRH, the primary value of such an interest in a Mitchell Lama housing project was in a highly speculative tax law sale. The return to Penn Central on such an interested interest dependent on the unpredictable state of the tax laws four to ten years later. Costello trumped Trump on the cover that week. The final and most important difference between the Trump and HRH offers was that Trump's attempt to share in the land profits appeared to violate the then applicable Mitchell Lama guidelines, bearing a developer, barring a, de a developer from profiting on a land he does not own when he submits the sites to government agencies for approval. The consequences of Trump's ill-conceived sharing plan was that if the project were approved at all, the government agencies would have to purchase the land at its minimum price in order to eliminate potentially illegal Trump profits. The HRH offer contained a minimum that doubled Trump's. Getzoff's early ally in opposing the Trump transaction was David Berger, attorney for the Penn Central stockholders. An associate in Berger's firm at the time, Edward Rubinstein, um, Rubenstone took the deposition from Eichler stating on the record that no honest attempt was made by Eichler, by Eichler to determine what other persons were willing to pay for these properties. Rubenstone also grilled the appraiser selected by Eichler in a 235-page deposition that revealed that. The Philadelphia appraiser had never estimated a New York residential or industrial property. His appraisal assigned no value to the existing structures on the two sites, which had been previously assessed by the city at $6 million. In arriving at his value for the 30th Street Yards as zoned, the appraiser compared the parcels exclusively with land sales in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. The resultant appraisal paid the 30th Street Yards as $4 per square foot, or $8 million as currently zoned, with a value increasing to $27 million if rezoned for residential use. 
These depressed values were compared by Rubenstone and gets off to two nearby Penn Central sales at $26 and $32 per square foot. The land under Manhattan Plaza, located in between the two yards on the west side, had gone for as high as $82 per square foot after rezoning. Even the land for Trump's own Starrett City project in Brooklyn had sold for $11 per square foot. Most important, the appraisers conceded that he had applied a 50% discount on the land to cover the time and cost the developer would incur over the years it would take to complete such a large project. The appraiser did not anticipate that under the Trump deal, a major portion of these costs were to be assumed by Penn Central. He figured them as the buyer's burden and discounted for them. HRH had indicated a willingness to pay the undiscounted price of $124 million for the 30th Street and 60th Street properties. Reuben Stone told me, I thought we had the deal broken. The appraiser's deposition was pretty devastating in terms of the fair market value of the property. The same day Reuben Stone took the appraisal deposition, he called Getzoff and asked him to come to Philadelphia to testify at the hearing as a witness for the stockholders. Getzoff was to testify about the Starrett bid and withdrawal, as well as the terms of the forthcoming HRH offer. When Getzoff arrived in Philadelphia on November 11, he learned that Berger, Eichler, and Trump, Reuben Stone, had been taken off the case a few days before the hearing, had been meeting for several days, and Berger no longer wanted him to appear as a witness. In fact, Berger said he would now speak on behalf of the Trump deal, which had been amended to increase Penn Central's share of the land price, as well as the size of its option in the development project. Trump had also amended the contract to provide that if he were not allowed to share in the land profits, as the guidelines indicated he would not, then he could walk away from the deal. The only loser would be Penn Central, which would then forfeit the, the $750,000 it would have take advanced to cover the developer's preliminary expenses. So by making the deal, he made sure he would win way more money than he should have. And by failing the deal, he made sure he would still win money that he shouldn't have had. Getzoff was stunned, but even more indicative of Berger's new attitude was his approach to Getzoff and a housing consultant who had accompanied him to the Philadelphia that morning. Getzoff wrote a memor memorandum to himself immediately after these events. It reads, Mr. Berger took us aside and suggested that instead of fighting, wouldn't I withdraw the HRH proposal so the whole matter could be settled at the hearing. Mr. Berger stated that he wasn't sure that if we played ball, he could work out a very satisfactory brokerage commission for us. We, Getzoff and his consultant, informed Mr. Berger that we, we don't play that kind of game. Getzoff also recalled that later that day, Trump approached him with a similar question. This arrogant young man patted me on the back in a most patronizing manner and asked me if I might be his broker. I assured him that I was not in the need of having a patron builder. He said that it's rare that you people, meaning brokers, are honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I said that. If I did, fine, Trump said to me. I also talked with Edward Rubenstone, now a member of another Philadelphia law firm, who confirmed Getzoff's account of his conversation with Berger. I do recall being a little distressed at what happened there. Asked if he could explain the Berger shift, he replied, to tell you the truth, I really can't. The negotiations were really taken over by Berger. What happened was that at some point it was decided that we were not going to continue to oppose the sale to Trump. And there was really no substantial explanation given. I thought I had him nailed. I wasn't in a position to argue or make a, a stink. I thought we had a pretty solid case and suddenly it was decided not to pursue it. That troubles me. One immediate consequence of the Berger switch was Getzoff would no longer be able to present the HRH case as a witness for a party to the action. Indeed, Penn Central attorneys tried to prevent him from detailing the offer in court at all by arguing that he had no legal standing. But Judge John Fulham wanted to hear it, complaining that I am not at all satisfied that there has been necessarily adequate consideration given to the competing offers. Fulham reserved decision and ended the hearing. The debate continued. Ravitch wrote Fulham in January 1975 enclosing a 20-page comparison of the Trump and HRH bids and requesting that he reopen the hearing. Instead, the judge issued an order that March confirming the Trump deal. His basic reason 
No party to the reorganization proceeding has expressed objections to the present proposal. Burger switch had been decisive. Fulham said that it is the function of the trustees to make business judgments and that he should interfere, he should interfere with the trustees' proposed actions only if they are legally impermissible. The Eichler firms and thus the trustees' support of the transaction had also been decisive. Fulham concluded that the HRH had not placed itself in a position of litigating. Ravage had expressly refused to file a motion to reopen the case. His attorney later explained he did not want to litigate. He was content to make the bid and not go beyond the bid. This curious reluctance might have been prompted by the relationship both Ravage and Trump enjoyed with the new governor, Hugh Carey. Trump had been... Trump had been Kerry's largest post-primary contributor in 1974, having donated a total of $35,000. Both he and Ravage had just been named by Kerry as the only developers on the statewide housing task force. Ravage had also just been asked by Kerry to take over the fiscally troubled State Urban Development Corporation. A public court fight between Ravage and Trump over two prime Manhattan housing sites would have been unseemly and time-consuming. Ravage told me that his failure to press his bid legally had nothing to do with his and Trump's relation with Kerry. He said that his appointment at UDC had left him with no time to pursue new business ventures. In the end, Trump got his land, investing nothing but his time and effort, and squeezing every ounce of potential profit out of the deal. The Burger Connection. On January 19th, 1977, Fred and Donald Trump filed a $100 million antitrust suit in Brooklyn federal court against nine major oil companies for fixing the price of heating oil. The suit was not a class action. Only those landlords listed as plaintiffs will benefit from a favorable settlement. It seeks damages to be divided between Trump and the law firm that had originated the case in 1974 and is listed on all court records as attorney for the Trumps. David Berger of Philadelphia. It should be remembered that in 1974, David Berger was also the attorney representing the Penn Central stockholders. And the story gets crazier. So the suit began in July 1974 with a single plaintiff, the the Lefrac organization. Richard Lefrac says that Berger felt that more than one plaintiff should be involved. Berger's reason for having additional clients was not just to raise the total amount of damages from which Berger takes one third. Each plaintiff landlord also paid an advance to Berger, a former Philadelphia corporate corporation counsel and unsuccessful candidate for DA Berger was experienced in oil company conspiracy cases, having won a $29 million settlement in a gas price fixing case in New Jersey in 1973. Berger is running the case, Lefrac said, He's the band leader. The record of the heating oil case resolves around the issue raised by the oil companies that in 1974 and early 1975, Berger actively engaged in the recruitment of potential plaintiffs for it, a violation of the legal canons and grounds for disqualifying Berger from the suit. As evidence of this allegation, the oil companies introduced blank law firm retainer forms on Berger letterhead describing the terms of the agreement between Berger and the plaintiffs. The forms were being widely distributed to co-ops and apartment owners by a New York real estate firm. Berger denied that he'd had any knowledge of the real estate firm's activities through an associate in his law firm stated in court in January 1975. We're going to have to have a substantial number of additional plaintiffs, some of whom fall into the commercial relationship as Lefrac others who may be cooperatives and the like. The judge dismissed the issue, commenting that distribution of the law firm retainer forms were, was regrettable since, not, since one not privy to the intricate chain of events could misinterpret the distribution as involving improper solicitation. Eight plaintiffs joined Lefrac, bringing the damages sought to almost a billion dollars. Berger's advance fees were based upon the number of apartment units each plaintiff brought into the case. Trump's number of apartments was among the largest. 
I asked Trump how he'd gotten involved in the suit and first he described himself as one of the original instigators of the case. Though I was involved in the case from its inception, he said I didn't file as a plaintiff until later. When I raised the subject again, noting Berger's roles in the Penn Central case at the same time, Trump began to emphasize that his suit had occurred two years after the Penn Central sale. He also contended that it was all, another attorney, Eugene Morris of Denmoy, of Dem, of, of Demov and Morris, who contacted him about the case, not David Berger. But Richard Lefrac, who'd started the suit with Berger in 1974, recalled that Trump was involved in the beginning. He joined the case within 90 days of the filing of the complaint. Lefrac said that Trump had attended meetings at the office of realtor George Melman three or four years ago. Melman confirmed Trump's attendance at an early meeting. He went along right away. This was in 1974 and may have been prior to the filing of the case. Berger came up and attended the meeting too. Lefrac said, however, that Trump may not have filed his complaint until 1977 because there were different categories of complaints and, he, and the case was broken into separate parts. Last month, Trump made a deposition in this case. While he would not pinpoint just when he began his involvement with it, he said it was a very substantial number of months before the January 1977 filing. Whenever the oil company attorney attempted to question him about how he'd entered the case, Berger's associate instructed Trump not to answer. At one point he said, there will be no questions about the nature of why the Trump organization is or is not a plaintiff in this lawsuit. In my brief interview with Berger, he was just as evasive. He began by contending that he hadn't represented Trump on the case, that Denmov and Morris did. I countered by pointing out that Denmov and Morris, Morris's name didn't appear in any case records until November 1978. He replied that he couldn't explain that. I pointed out that his name had again and again, in fact, had again and again. In fact, Berger had been presented at Trump's deposition. What seems clear is that Trump's association with this case, one of Berger's most important and potentially profitable legal actions, dates back to the same time frame of his sudden switch to the Penn Central transaction. A portion of Barrett's story. So this guy, that's the writer. The Palmieri connection. In September 1973, prior to the Trump negotiations and the sale of the Penn Central rail yards, a small Los Angeles-based investment and management firm, Victor Palmieri and Co., had been retained by the PCTC trustees as an outside contractor to develop, sell, or lease PCTC properties. Edward Eichler was then Palmieri's vice president. The company's profits were, in part, pegged to a percentage of sales negotiated. Palmieri and Co. would negotiate sale propose it to the trustees, and with their approval, petition the court for acceptance. That is how Trump obtained not only the 30th and 60th Street Yards, but the Commodore Hotel, which he is now transforming into a government-aided $80 million Hyatt Hotel. All of the Trump's historic Manhattan ventures and the extraordinary terms he negotiated for these purchases are rooted in his relationship with Palmieri. Victor Palmieri, 49, is the founder of VPCO, a company that has made a fortune out of the collapse of Penn Central. In addition to the fees he had received managing Penn Central real estate, he has already made in excess of $21 million in incentive fees alone, on top of salaries, expenses, and a flat annual fee, for handling the assets of other Penn Central subsidiaries. In a profile last year, the Wall Street Journal cited Palmieri critics who claimed that he'd gotten his lucrative court assignments due to his influence with the important people he knows. The journal said he is described by the critics as an active Democratic Party member. Other critics have gone even further. They say that Palmieri's contracts create a mon uh, momentum to dump property simply to accumulate fees. Um, can someone read real quick for a little bit? I will. Okay. There's no question but that Palmieri's political connections are national in scope. 
1967, he was named Deputy Executive Director of the Kerner Commission on Civil Disorder by President Lyndon Johnson. In that position, he made contact with a host of national political figures, including Commission member John Lindsay. His aide at the commission, John Koskinen, including uh, Koskinen wound up working for Lindsay and Connecticut Senator Abraham Ribicoff before rejoining Palmieri as principal of VPCO in 1973. Palmieri was active in John Tunney's 1970 Senate campaign in California and through Tunney is said to have entered the Kennedy political circle. Last year, Palmieri was selected by the scandal-ridden Teamsters Central States Pension Fund to manage its $600 million worth of real estate west of the Mississippi River. The selection was made by the Teamsters themselves, though approved by the Department of Labor. Palmieri and Trump were drawn together. It is clear from the Eichler affidavit in the Penn Central case that Palmieri strategy is the Palmieri strategy is to identify political entrepreneurs not merely to develop sites, but to develop relationships. Palmieri and Trump operated in the same way. Palmieri was a national broker in search of a local broker and ally. One sign of the relationship was that in 1976, Trump located an office for himself next door to Palmieri's. Recently, a note on the door indicated that packages for Trump could be delivered to Palmieri's office. The business relationship between Trump and Palmieri soon extended beyond the Penn Central properties. In July 1975, Palmieri was named by a Connecticut federal judge to manage Levitt and Sons, Inc., a home building company that International Telephone and Telegraph was being forced to divest as part of a government antitrust action. The judge told me he picked Palmieri in part on the reference of another federal judge who'd known Koskinen when both had worked for Ribicoff. A bonus was built into the contract with Palmieri. The quicker they sold Levitt, the larger Palmieri's take. But that was no simple task. For four years, there'd been no takers. In early 1977, Palmieri suddenly had an interested potential buyer, Starrett Housing Company. The leadership and name of Starrett had changed since the 1974 bid on the Penn Central sites. Alnick was gone, but Donald Trump was still a principal equity owner of Starrett City and had just selected Starrett to build his Hyatt Hotel, Starrett's largest domestic contract that year. Starrett studied Levitt and its potential market for what it described in its annual report as many months. In February 1978, Starrett purchased the company for $30 million. Although Trump admitted to being the broker for the deal, he refused to say what his commission was. Neither Palmieri nor the judge was too clear on just what Palmieri's profit on the sale was either, though the judge was certain that part of the healthy fee was due to his speedy disposition of the company. As part of the acquisition package arranged by Trump, Starrett gave a five-year employment contract to Levitt's top executive, who had been installed by Palmieri. Levitt's president, now operating on a lucrative Starrett contract, is none other than Trump's old friend, Edward Eichler, who handled the Penn Central deal with Trump. The birth of the conventions of a convention center even before Trump's deal on the 30th Street Yards had been confirmed by the court, he had dropped any pretense of developing it, a house, developing it as a housing site. I envisioned it as a convention center prior to the final court decision, he said. Despite the clear terms of his agreement with Penn Central, which called for housing on 30th Street and foreclosed a role for him in any government purchase, he began to promote the site. The problem was that Abe Beam and City Planning Commissioner John Zuccotti, both of whom had aided him in the acquisition of the yards, were committed to another convention center site on the waterfront at 44th Street. Even Bunny Lindenbaum, his son Sandy, and publicist Howard Rubenstein, the brokers closest to Beam, were under retainer to the 44th Street Convention Center Corporation formed by the state legislature. In 1974, some Clinton opponents of 44th Street 
had actually advocated the 34th Street as a possible alternative. However, after the board estimate voted to fund rehabilitation plan for Clinton around 44th Street site, neighborhood groups became persuaded that the only way the city would deliver on its promised rehabilitation was to accept the convention center. But just as community opponents were becoming resigned to the center, its political supporters were pulling back. Tom Galvin, then executive vice president of the Convention Center Corporation, said he quit in May 1975 because with Beam as mayor, I could see the death knell of the projects coming. Though the city continued to pour money into the site, paying $1,500 a month for Rubenstein and $36,000 to Lindbaum firm, ultimately wasting up to $17 million on it, the project was going nowhere. Neither Beam nor Trump can recall when they first discussed the 30th Street Yards as a convention center site, but Trump told me that when he conceived the idea, his initial approach was to Beam directly. Since he had been spending money on the site, Beam clearly had not discouraged him, although, Trump's, although Trump remembers the mayor as skeptical. A Palmieri affidavit filed in the Philadelphia dates the beginning of Trump's negotiations with the city as of October 1975, around the same time as Beam, citing fiscal problems, announced that the city would pull out of the 44th Street Convention Center project. A few weeks after the Beam announcement, Trump retained Howard Rubenstein, quickly ending three years of Rubenstein's promotional efforts on behalf of the 44th Street site. The same week, Trump bought in, brought in Sandy Lindbaum, Lindenbaum, who had handled zoning on 44th Street. Bunny Lindenbaum, who also left the 44th Street project, told me he began working with Trump more in the role of an informal family advisor than as a lawyer. Kind of reminds me of other things going on now. Trump's proposal of a privately financed state guaranteed center was on the face of it dubious. If attainable at all, it was as applicable to 44th Street as it was to 34th. He now concedes that this proposal made primarily to counterbalance a sudden Battery Park City proposal was not serious. I never wanted to be the developer of, of the convention center, he said. I wanted the site to be chosen. There was no way a profit could be made as a developer. But Battery Park City, meant, City emerged with its own financing. Tom Galvin recalls, that the Port Authority had been quietly trying to strike a deal with Beam offering to finance the center. The Port Authority's willingness to take the expected operating losses on the center could have been counterbalanced by the city's willingness to waive other Port Authority payments. Beam balked, and he and the Port Authority did announce, however, that the authority would do a $100,000 feasibility study on the Battery Park site for the city. The sun shines on 34th Street. For this new enemy, which Trump characterized as the Rockefeller interest, Trump needed new upfront allies. Trump says that in the middle of 1975, he'd begun, 1975, he had begun discussing his convention center idea with Kerry fundraiser Louise Sunshine. At a, dinner pay, at a dinner to pay off the governor's campaign debts. Sunshine, who was the finance director of Kerry's 74 and 78 campaigns, was the right person to talk to. In addition to her role with Kerry, she was treasurer of the state Democratic Party and National Democratic Committee, Committee woman with New York, from New York. She had been a fundraiser for former assemblyman Albert Blumenthal and had important political relationships on the west side where Trump needed allies to counter 44th Street. One significant contact was with State Senator Manfred Orenstein, who as minority leader had named her to the advisory council to the Democrats on the New York Senate. I told her I was looking for someone to take the burden of the convention center off my back, Trump told me and asked who she'd suggest I hire. She called me the next day and said she'd driven to the site herself. She said it is the greatest site for the convention, convention center. She, would, she worked on it a long time without pay. Finally, she came on staff. Rubenstein issued a press release announcing Sunshine's position in February 1976, 
at the peak of the enthusiasm for Battery Park. She registered as a Trump lobbyist with the Secretary of State. In November, Trump filed an obligatory end of session corporate statements detailing $13,058 worth of salary and expenses associated with Sunshine's lobbying efforts. Did you want to keep reading or do you want me to take over? It doesn't matter. Um, it's just after eight. How much more is there to go? Um, let me highlight. Uh, three and a half more pages. They, they'll go fast, I think. Because yeah. we're on page 56 and it only goes to 59. So three and a half more pages. Yeah. Is that okay? Are you guys okay if we continue? I'm okay. I'll leave everybody else. Does anybody want, want to stop? <clears throat> okay, I'll keep reading. Sunshine failed to file her pre-session lobbyist statements in 1977 until she was reminded by the Secretary of State's office at the end of the session. She didn't file at all in 1978, nor did Trump file his corporate report. Since Trump refers to her continuing efforts on behalf of the convention center site, it appears that she is currently an unlicensed lobbyist, having failed to file her 1979 pre-session statement. The last record of Sunshine's lobbying activity is Trump's report of her $25,000 salary in August 1977. Failure to file annually constitutes a Class A misdemeanor for both employer and lobbyist under the existing disclosure laws. In her 1976 filing, Sunshine had stated that she intended to appear before, really quick, when you're a lobbyist, um, when you're a lobbyist and when you're, I think, a foreign agent lobbyist, whatever it is you do, you have to file, um, I think it's either once or twice per year, and you have to file every transaction and every money and amount of money you gave to every person that you lobbied. And so if you're doing things that are shifty and shady, then you're not going to want to file those things. So it makes sense. And they usually have to be available for the public to be able to look at and see. So they probably wouldn't have wanted the information available. <clears throat> Sunshine had stated that she intended to appear before the legislative committees at the, and the governor upon all measures affecting the proposed 34th Street Convention Center site. While she lobbied, she would retain her position as an advisor to Senate Democrats and fundraiser to the governor. Kerry has since appointed Sunshine to the Thruway Authority and the Job Development Authority. Her alliance with Trump was widely perceived as this tangible sign of Kerry's commitment to Trump's sites. That is how Trump intended it, to counter any movement toward Battery Park. Working simultaneously for Trump and Kerry, Sunshine's functions as Kerry appointee lobbyist and fundraiser had blended together. <clears throat> the largest individual carry campaign contributor, exceeded only by the governor's brother, was none other than Donald Trump's company's $125,000 since 1974. Howard Rubenstein says that Sunshine made the great bulk of the contacts that produced lists of 34th Street supporters not surprisingly. Those lists read like a carry campaign financial statement. Many of the new corporate and real estate boosters were quickly shifting allegiance from the 44th Street site, which had become the site championed by the Clinton groups and community planning board for whose our area included both the 44th and 34th Street sites. Trump eventually forced the Port Authority to add his site to its study. By the time the Port Authority reported in June, the political impetus and financial fe feasibility of the Battery Park City idea had already receded. The report gave the Port Authority's even-handed blessing to either side. It also put to rest Trump's ruse of private financing and concluded that a bond-issuing authority would have to develop the center. Trump started manufacturing reports. In November 1976, a group of graduate students at the New School for Social Research did a class study of the available sites and favored 34th Street. Then City Councilman Robert Wagner Jr., who taught at the school, served as an advisor on the study, which was never released. He and the school agree the study did not in any way represent Wagner's views, but Trump wound up with a copy and started touting it as the Wagner Report. Wagner says that he later told Trump and Sunshine to stop using it. Nonetheless, Trump described it to me as a professionally done report and said Bob Wagner Jr. came out with a very strong statement that 34th Street was the best site. <clears throat> 
Then Trump parlayed Sunshine's relationship with Manfred Orenstein into a stunning blow against the 44th Street site. In 1973 to 74, Orenstein had refused community pleas that he, he support 34th Street. But by 76, after the special zoning district had been created and Clinton had been promised rehabilitation, there was a near unanimous community consensus around 44th Street. Beam's decision to forego building the center was a seen as merely a temporary setback. Suddenly, according to neighborhood activ activists, Orenstein released a report favoring 34th Street. He consulted no one in the neighborhood, said one. In 1976, Trump began contributing to Orenstein's personal and Senate majority campaign committees. He's given $10,000 since. But the Orenstein and implicit carry um, support did not move with the defense. The defense is now formed around 44th Street, headed by Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> John Zuccotti. Around the time of Warrenstein's report, Zuccotti had formed the State City Working Committee and stacked it with proponents of 44th Street. Beam told me I didn't name anybody to the thing. Zuccotti sparked that. I had no objection. The Working Committee had a staff component and a quasi-board of high-level officials. The staff favored 34th Street with various caveats. The board leaned toward 44th with some advocates of the battery. So in April 1977, the committee disbanded without reaching any public conclusion. Zuccotti later left the city and Beam moved into his mayoral primary campaign, promising that after the election, he'd finally settle this thing. A portion of Barrett's story. Beam had an effect, killed the 44th Street site in 1975. He'd killed Battery Park City in 1976. When he turned a cold ear to those Port Authority officials who had warned to finance and uh, operate a center, but only at the battery. Indeed, court records suggest that Beam had quietly uh, acquiesced to the 34th Street side as early as April 1976, when Palmieri and Co. had asked Judge Fulham to change 34th Street from a housing use to a convention center site. The new terms anticipated approximately a $17 million increase in the cost of the land to the city and built it into the agreement a Trump fee of up to $2 million. Not surprisingly, David Berger, who was only months away from formally representing Trump in the oil company case, raised no objections to the new deal. Even though Trump's few Trump's fee would come out of whatever account, account the amount the city or state would pay Berger's clients, the Penn Central stockholders. Since the Penn Central appraisal had valued the convention center per portion of the site roughly half of the 30th Street property at $4 million, the city would have probably acquired it by condemnation for that amount and avoided the payment of any fees to Trump. Under the amendment, Trump was, was cut into a condemnation sale and guaranteed a flat fee of $500,000. $500, he was also given a third sale a uh, third sales price if he could drive the city's price past a minimum of $13.5 million. Trump is now seeking $21 million for land the city or state might have got for roughly $4 million um, dollars three and a half years ago. Ironically, Palmieri and Co. had described the site as a wasting asset declining in value in order to get court approval for the original sale in 1975. <clears throat> These amendments, plus the affidavit stating that Beam had abandoned 44th Street and indicating that the Port Authority was the only obstacle to the 34th Street site, were formally served on the city. The court awaited oh, um, any comments or objections. Finally, Judge Fulham approved the amendments in late May 1976. By an act of omission, the city had permitted approval of the terms that had made Trump's search for convention center support so potentially profitable to begin with. Shortly after his primary defeat, Beam appointed another committee, Richard Ravitch, who'd lost the site to Trump in Philadelphia and whose firm had subsequently been retained by Trump to cost out his convention center, chaired it. Ravitch's support, while favoring 34th Street, concluded that the differences among the three sites were marginal. Ravitch's reported and Beam endorsed the site right before he left office. Last April, Koch, Kerry, Orenstein, and Trump confirmed Beam's selection and jointly announced agreement on 34th Street. Since then, Orenstein has been introducing legislation and the Republicans have been blocking it. 
After last month's special legislative session, Carrion Majority Leader Warren Anderson indicated that they'd agreed on a plan of state funding. But word out of Albany is that State Senator John Marchi, angered by what he regards, or Mar Marchi, I'm going to say, as uh, the Orhenstein organized and Trump financed election, electoral call, challenge he just went through in November, a product of Orenstein's drive to elect a Democratic majority in the Senate, says he will block any convention center built on Trump-owned land. No one is quite sure how serious Mark he is, but in Trump's world, there is some, something, fitting, something fitting about Mark he's strange reasoning. It is a kind of ultimate quid pro... <laughs> It is a kind of an ultimate quid pro quo and a transaction plagued in every detail for half a decade by quid pro quos. <laughs> I forgot this is in here. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing right. new under <laughs> All he knows, this is the basis for his understanding of how things work in life. If every single relationship is transactional, if you want to go make a relationship with the president of Ukraine, it has to be transactional. And transactional means quid pro quo. That's all he knows. That is his DNA. And, and, and he's also Teflon Don. He does the, the wink, wink, nod, nod thing to where his people know what he wants them to do so he doesn't speak it so then that makes it to where things don't stick to him yep yeah and that's what they're fighting yeah they need to they need to enter this into evidence in the judiciary committee <laughs> right here and have them read this out this this man nadler needs to get on this anyways there is bound to be at least one deal too many in this chronology there is nothing terrible about Trump's convention center site. It is, I am sure, as good as the others. In hours of interviews, Trump's, Trump almost sold me on it, and he's clearly prevailed with some government officials, like City Planning, Planning Commissioner Robert Wagner, despite rather than because of his brand of political intrigue. My curl is that $400 million of state funds could salvage entire neighborhoods, that New York City already is the top convention city in America and has an exhibit exhibition hall that is turning a profit for the city and that Trump side will never pass any fair environmental test precisely because it see it sees midtown as the city and will concentrate thousands of people um, with their cars and their sea sewage right right where the city can't cope with them Trump's answer to this kind of um, pro neighborhood argument was contained in the New York Times piece about him two years ago I think the city will get better, he said. I'm not talking about the South Bronx. I don't know anything about the South Bronx. What he doesn't understand is that the South Bronx is this city. Its problems were created by someone else's deals, and the problems remain at least partially because of the deals that ignore them, deals like his own. There is one final twist to this story. State laws provide that no one can get a broker's commission on a transaction unless he was a licensed broker throughout the negotiations of the deal. Trump and the City Planning Commission have described Trump's service on the 34th Street as those of a broker. The problem is that young Donald Trump didn't become a licensed broker until after his contract with Penn Central had been completely negotiated and approved by Judge Fulham. But brokerage licenses are merely pesky requirements of the law. In this two-part history, we've been looking into a world where only the greed is magnified. The actors are pretty small and, and venal. Their ideas are small, never transcending profit. In it, however, are the men elected to lead us and those who buy them. And in it, unhappily, are the processes and decisions that shape our city and our lives. So we can, we can take this out um, and put in this two-part history, we've been looking into a world where only greed is magnified. The actors are pretty small and venal. Their ideas are small, never transcending profit. In it, however, are the men elected to lead us and those who buy them. And in it, unhappily, are the processes and decisions that shape our country and our lives. And you can have today in our lives right now because it escalated from New York to the entire country.
that's where we are. And Donald Trump took over the job of the people he was buying and controlling. So now he's the broker and he's the city politician. So he's both of them now, which makes him the most dangerous human being. So that's kind of what he's doing with the cabinet too, right? Like when, um, they're just, they're leaving and he's taking over those positions basically, yeah. right? He's consolidating power. Why, why would you share? If you're Donald Trump, why would you share a position of power with anyone who has a viewpoint or idea that's contrary to your own? Right. That makes no sense if you're DJT. I found it interesting also the connection with the Clintons way back then. Yeah. I mean, is I, that, it, was, was it the same? It was is that, it the same? I don't know. I don't know if it is either back in the 70s because they were in Arkansas, so I don't know. I wondered about that. But in that movie on Netflix? One of yeah, the what is that called? I want to watch that. Um, Donald Trump, An American Dream. And uh, it shows in the last one, the one, the last one goes into politics right up until, or just before the election, I think it's, I can't remember, but it ends with saying, you know, basically saying that something about him could win the presidency. And anyway, so, um, it shows you remember he was the one that the big the big one that was pushing the um, Obama birth certificate thing. And when Obama then released his birth certificate, he made an announcement, a brief announcement about it. But then they had the the correspondence dinner, the big event they do what once a year. And Trump was there, and Obama got up and made a speech and talked about how. You know how he had released it, and it was done in a comical way because they do like roasting and things like that at those events. And so I'm, I'm sure it was meant to be funny and no harm done. But what we're learning about Trump is completely um, he doesn't he doesn't take to people making jokes about him. So Obama stands up there and and talks about how he knows that this probably isn't going to um, um, satisfy everyone, but hopefully it satisfies. The, the you know the people I don't remember everything he said about it but Trump had made a statement that oh this is good now that he's released it I haven't seen it yet but now that he's released it he says um, now we can put it to rest and we can all go back to doing more important things and, and I'm thinking can't believe he actually said that so so then Obama is making his speech and jokes and he's talking about how we can all go back to more important things like um, the, what did he, he brought up the, did, did we really land on the moon? Did we this? He brought up several conspiracy theories and he was aiming it all right at Trump. And Trump and Melania were there and they had the camera on him. And you could just see in him that he does not like people joking about him. It's no joke. He cannot take a joke. He can't be laughed at. And, and that's what's happening right now today with the leaders over in NATO laughing at him. So it's just, yeah, it's pretty, you know, it's just like a different, what do you want to say it? It's like there's so many different angles to his background and who he is. This is just some of it. Wow. But they make the statement in the movie that that was probably at that moment that he decided, because it talks about in the movie how he always wanted to be a part of the establishment. I don't know when they use the word establishment if they meant establishment like the political elites establishment that he wants to destroy, or if it meant the establishment of like the rich and wealthy, but he always wanted to be the be a part of the establishment. And it seems like he was getting hit on every end. So when he got laughed at, they make the statement that that was probably when he decided he was going to um, run and win. Well, wasn't he already part of the rich and famous and stuff? Yeah, well, he was pretty broke. <laughs> I don't know what he, yeah. I don't know what he, I don't, because you, you know, a lot of rich people, you, you can read these stories that this article that we're reading, they don't put any of their own money into anything. They get other people, and it's, it's like, and my ex-husband's real bad. He, I don't know if he's still in prison right now, but, but that man made a made a fortune living off of other people's money and making and using other people's money to fund and build um, um, construction projects. 
Yeah. And he would literally um, bankrupt people. And then he'd leave with his paycheck. He didn't pay people. So I was describing, I, I don't know if it was to Mike I said it or not, but, but it's like Donald Trump is like Ray Clark on steroids. And he uses other people's money to do the things that he does instead of his own money. Um, but the thing that they says that got him into trouble, and I remember back, I remember the hearing this stuff on the news at the time with the Taj Mahal and all that. He started buying things before the Taj Mahal. He started buying things, bought this big yacht, bought his airplane, got his helicopter, all these other things, and just started buying things, went on a spending spree. And, you know, it was commented about it because, hey, you can only, you only have so much. You know what I mean? He was trying to be like everybody else. It, that's what I got out of the movie. He was really trying to be um, the socialite of socialites. And uh, well, it makes sense then while he, why he might have always hated the, the Clintons. Yeah. Well, the, the Clintons, then they show it his wedding when he married Melania at Mar-a-Lago. It was all um, very private. No cameras were allowed, no phones were allowed in or anything like that. But with the video that was shown of it, I guess that they had control over, he was right there, cozied up um, arm in arm with the Clintons, him and Melania and the Clintons together. Huh. But he has really no friends. It's whatever is going to be like a transaction, like you said. It's all for. Well, it could, it, that is something I, I can't, I don't know if I should repeat this, but one of the videos I was watching on that whole thing, what happened with Macron and Trudeau in France, well, or not France, wherever they were, where they were having the meeting. Yeah. They called them um, the real housewives of NATO. Oh. <laughs> because they're acting what they did. Yeah. And it made sense. But if you're going to be a socialite, I mean, that's what you do. You sit around and you gossip about garbage and other socialites and then to their face, you pretend like you're friends or something, you know? Yeah. That's their culture. But really quick, when was that um, dinner with... Um, the correspondence dinner? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember if it was before or after the second term for Obama, but somewhere in that period of Obama. Um, yeah, somewhere in that period of Obama. But the video clip of it is in the movie, so you'd be able to find it and probably figure it out from there. Okay, so the Clinton in New York, I think, was do it Clinton. Um, so Somebody there's that. A different Clinton? Yeah, I think it's a different one. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. Just because of the timeline in Clinton the Clintons didn't come on the scene until the 90s, I think? Yeah, well, it, um, so if in the 1970s and for about two decades, the Clintons actually were having their own real estate scandal in Arkansas, right. which right. was called Whitewater. <laughs> right. And that's why I was, I did, I mean, I don't know if they were there in the New York circle, the way this article was writing or not, but because they were, from Arkansas and that's where they were at prior to coming big on the scene but they were doing their own stuff yes yeah well they're all shady they all know how to you know and, and it's interesting when you talk about the rich oppressing the poor and they get rich off of the backs of the poor well there you go you know what I mean he's living off of the backs of other people and then when, like I said earlier when it came to the Taj Mahal and when he finally went bankrupt nobody got paid all those people lost you know, and all the people that lost jobs, everything, and he didn't care. And then after that, maybe somebody else understands this better than I do, but he went to Wall Street to um, get his brand on the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ, one or the other, to where people could buy into his enterprise. Um, he literally got his money back, you know what I'm saying? While yeah. the rest of the people got nothing. And he was still making money off the people. You know what I mean? Instead of his, instead of going out there in the sweat of your brow. And there was one interview where it talked about it was him, because all of these, all this, this whole video put together was all the real people, the actual people. And there were people that were friends and enemies of him describing him now, and then you know showing back video footage from before. Forgot what I was going to say. I was going to say something else, but anyways. 
But it's no wonder that Trump announced that he's leaving New York behind and all the New Yorkers like celebrated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to Florida where oh, oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, no one yeah. ever liked you here. Get out of here. Yeah, and then it shows, um, and I don't remember what year this was, it shows where where one one event when he's in Mar-a-Lago, Mar where he tell, I can't remember who it was he told, to play the music, it was rock music, play it as loud as you can, because he wanted to, he said, all these stiffs down here, they didn't want me here, and I wanted to know, I don't remember how he said it, but you'll watch it if you see it, that, that uh, I'm here. <laughs> and uh, he's just... It's just amazing, though, in, in the very beginning of the movie, and I remember footage, and I remember watching a while back the Ronan Barrett interview, he, he really did look like a different person. I'm not saying that he was, didn't always have this inside of him, but there was a change, you can tell, just watching the, the, the movie, you can see this change in demeanor that, that came about. Um, he probably was always still doing some of the same shady things, but he was getting skilled in it, you know what I mean? And his skill got him, uh, uh, built his ego. But he didn't seem to have the same look and demeanor on him as, I mean, he actually looked like a decent person. Whereas, That's what I always thought, too. It's like he became a caricature of himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's really sad to, to, to see what Satan can do when we allow him when we when whatever whether you whether you openly admit that you allow him or what but it's it's amazing to see that i mean just and i wrote to somebody maybe it was victoria does anybody sit around and dream about being the final pharaoh antichrist of the world it's like he probably didn't dream that up without even knowing that's who he actually is it's really sad so Anyway, it's just my thoughts. Yeah, I wondered though about his past because I saw those like Oprah interviews and those past interviews with him, and he seems like a more decent person. But I, I honest, I mean, I really think that that was just like he was better at hiding it then, and well, I think it had to become what it is now for people for it to be so obvious. Yeah, well, I think it's a skill that got developed, but but from those that studied his dad more so too, um, the things I've heard about his dad and his relationship with his dad that <clears throat> that probably had to have played a role in what developed it because it was emphasized too that he was always trying to be better than his dad and uh, and do bigger and better things. So so that you know you, you it, it, we all started as babies somewhere in some sort of parental upbringing, you know, that has its effect on us. I don't know. But so he's got that going on. And then when he starts, you know, making good deals, big deals and making money and gets that tax abatement and all that, that your, your ego starts to grow and uh, you start to feel like you can just do anything. And then he fed off of what people said about him, just loved what people said about him. And uh, like I was saying earlier, he would read all the articles every day about himself and that was like during the apprentice time when this guy was seeing that so at that time you probably weren't hearing that there wasn't a lot of negative stuff about him because when the apprentice came out it was all good but it's amazing to watch somebody who um because there was one guy that said something negative about him and he was going to sue him and um however i don't remember what how it worked out but the guy took back what he said or apologized or whatever. I don't know. So Donald Trump, was like, he was like a total nice guy and dropped the lawsuit and then says, hey, picks up the phone and calls the guy and he says, hey, I, um, um, I want to talk to you. You know, he invited him into Trump Tower to go hire him and offer him a job. And the guy wound up working for him. And, and so he's, he's got this side of it. It's like, as long as you don't say anything bad about me, I'm okay. But yet you look at who he is today and he did it then. You can see it in the movie. You can see him actually doing it then. But he says so many terrible things about people. But when people speak the truth, and it happens to be a terrible thing, because that one guy that was that he was going to sue, he said a truth, <laughs> you know, about the the I think it was about the Taj Mahal and how financially there was no way he was going to make it. Something along those lines. And and uh, he just doesn't want anybody to say anything negative about him. And if you say anything negative about him, he'll go out and sue you like a bully. And and yet, 
you look at the things that he says about people that are, I don't know if anybody watched the other night. I've never watched other than maybe a few news clips of Trump rallies, but I watched some of that Trump rally the other night. He is off the hook when a different, even a more different person at those rallies than what we see. Has anybody ever watched him at a rally? Yeah, he goes with the hatred for the, the real off the chart. Yeah, and he's got, he's, he's emboldened. He's and emboldened. I don't know how to describe it, but he does something with his <laughs> voice. He like, he speaks different. I, he I sounds know. a lot like, so if you ever look at any documentaries of Hitler, it says that when he did public speeches, he had this like really guttural voice. Yeah, he, you, yeah. Would, you would hear him like pulling out this gurgle part that, that, came out like this evil girl part that comes out with his voice. And then there was somebody there, a protester in there. He says, get her out of here, get her out of here. And then he criticizes the security guy for being politically correct and not taking care of it because we can handle this. We, you know, we don't need to be politically correct, do we? Get him out of here. And it was just amazing that people actually feed on that and think that's great. And those are the people that were feeding him through Twitter. Um, because once he got on Twitter, it, it emphasizes that too. And I know Tess does too, but I mean, it was amazing to kind of watch how that played out. But people started, um, you, you know, he, came, he became in direct connection with the people through Twitter. And he loved it because they were praising him all the time. They were, they were lifting him up all the time. They were telling him, you should be president. You'd be great. You're this, you're that. And so he's just sitting there hearing all this and, you know, it just turned into an I, 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 me, 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 me person. You know what I mean? Yeah, Diva Trump. So um, just a quick note real quick. I think I put it in the chat earlier, in the teacher chat, that um, Brother Tyler's not coming, but Sister Kathy McGraw is coming in January. Okay. So... Um, make note of that. And then I put in the chat for people to start volunteer to sign up for February and March and April. Okay. Well, I'm done. If you want to, we can close out in prayer. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the history we were able to look at tonight that made the picture of the present so much clearer. We thank you for helping us find our way to these resources that help us to understand better the times that we're living in. Lord, we have two sets of bold paths, the one in our movement and in the um, spiritual things and then the one in the external and the literal things. Help us to become better acquainted with both and help us to be able to juggle both and to understand them and their applications in our time. Help us to continue in skill and understanding and how to use these rules and methodology. Help us to be able to draw closer to you. And if there's anything in our lives that we need to improve on, help us to see and find those areas, Lord, and, and to work on those while we have a peaceful time yet upon us because we know things are going to ramp up pretty quickly. Be with us for the rest of the week and uh, help us to get through it as best as possible. Help us to find more time to spend with you and in the study of your truths and um, be with the prayer meeting tomorrow morning and the devotion on Friday morning and help us to prepare for the Sabbath that's coming. Lord, we thank you so much for um, the time that we're living in, for helping us to be here on the right side of the issue. We ask that you continue to help us to prepare. Whatever the message is for this time period and this dispensation, it's already started and it's been slowly growing. So please help us Help us to be ready for the test that comes when that time period comes, Lord. And help us to be ready to do the work that we need to in the year after. We thank you for everything, Lord, that you've provided us and helped us with. And we pray all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 And just for another quick note um, on the Sabbath, I think I texted this out to several on the Sabbath. For terrible study in the afternoon. Check out 1 Samuel 22. I think that will do really well between us all, and it might be good practice, good encouragement for all of us.